It is a pleasure for me today to be with you on live to speak about updates in anemia in CKD patients. As when we can see, what about normal erythropoiesis? As we can see, red blood cell mutation can pass through several stages. Starts with in the bone marrow, stem cell usually proliferate to be to report in stem cell, which give the precursor, which is burst forming unit erythroplast cells, which will proceed to coniforming unit erythroplast cells, which will proceed to pro-erythroplast, then erythroplast, then reticulocytes, then red blood cells. At this situation, from 10 to 14 days, here comes the role of the erythropoietin for the proliferation of these cells. And following later five, seven days, here came the role of rapid iron uptake. And this will help for proliferation and maturation of the progenitor of the RBC, the red blood cell towards mature red blood cell. Anemia is a very important issue in our life because anemia is common. According WHO, 30% of the world's population have anemia. 80 to 90% of dialysis patients have anemia. 50% of all cancer patients are anemic. This means that dialysis patients are more prone to anemia, more than even cancer. As you can see here in this diagram, from stage one, stage two, stage three, starting from stage four, passing to stage five, the anemia prevalence became, became very high. It exceeds usually 60% to approach 70 to 80% and even more in, in this stage renal patients, especially those on dialysis. Anemia control benefit is very important because usually when you are correcting the anemia, you have several benefits. There is increased quality of life, exercise capacity, reduction in cardiac output, reduction of angina, improvement of LVH, decreased bleeding tendency, increased brain cognitive function, there is increased sexual function, increased endocrine function, increased immune function, and reduction of muscle metabolism, and reduction of hospitalization, and reduction of transfusion and nutrition. Several, several guidelines were, are concerned regarding management of anemia, such as KDGO guidelines, European best practice guidelines, National Kidney Foundation the KDUKI guidelines and the Canadian guidelines and NICE guidelines. For the KU guidelines, we found that In this situation, they have defi defined when to initiate ESA. ESA means erythropoietin stimulating agents. In CKD, non dialysis patients with hemoglobin less than 10, ESA start should be individualized according to the rate of the fall of the hemoglobin, the risk of needing a transfusion, the risk related to ESA therapy, and the presence of symptoms attributable to anemia. So that when your hemoglobin drops below 10, you should consider seriously according to your clinical situation to start ESA. For CKD, five patient dialysis. Here, ESA therapy should be used to avoid hemoglobin fall below nine gram per deciliter. Start it when hemoglobin is between nine to 10 gram per deciliter. This is very important. The individual therapy will be necessary as some patients may have improvements in quality of life at higher hemoglobin concentration. So that in this situation, if you believe that his life quality will be improved, you can even start ESA 
above 10, some of the population have better quality of life when they are above 11 and below 11, they are suffering from sexual, intellectual, and mental functions and others. The use of ESA and other agents to treat anemia, what about ESA maintenance therapy? In all patients, we recommend that ESA not be used to intentionally increase the hemoglobin above 13. Why? Because above 13, you will have a lot of complications such as thrombotic events, stroke, MI, and others. So that is totally accepted. In general, our targets when we are using ESA not be used to maintain hemoglobin concentration above 11.5. Most of us are accepting hemoglobin to be 10 to 11. 5, uh, 5 others from 10.5 to 11.5. This is very important. Here, the European Renal Association posted statement about, about KDU guidelines. They have insisted that hemoglobin values should not routinely be let to fall below 10 grams per deciliter. This is very important. And for maintenance therapy, our usual range is from 10 to 12 grams per deciliter. This is very, very important. What about the NICE guidelines? The NICE guidelines, they have insisted that you should treat the anemia when your regular level falls to 11 grams per deciliter or less, or they develop symptoms attributable to anemia, of course, such as tiredness, shortness of breath, lethargy, and palpitations. Who should receive eases? Treatment with ESA should be offered to people with anemia of CKD who are likely to benefit in terms of quality of life and physical function. This type of population, who are the active part in our population, they may need to be at a higher hemoglobin level approaching 11.5 grams per deciliter. So that and the NICE have stated that the target of hemoglobin is to maintain the, as the hemoglobin range between 10 to 12 grams per deciliter. The Kidoki have commented on the Kidoki and said, we are concerned that the novel identification of a lower bound of flexibility hemoglobin may increase use of blood transfusion and expose patients eligible for kidney transplantation allocation. We recognize that there is a positive of evidence that the hemoglobin concentration target between 11 and 11.5 is associated with a safety risk. This means that it is preferable to, to keep your patient at the higher aspect between 11 to 11.5, because if you have let your hemoglobin to drop to line, it may drop more to a lower levels, and here you need for blood transfusion, which is not recommended. The Kudugi clinical practice guidelines went to use iron. The iron therapy for adult CKD patients on easy therapy or not, we suggest a trial of IV iron, or in CKD non-dialysis patients, for a one to three month trial of oral iron therapy. An increase in hemoglobin concentration or decrease in ESA dose is desired. Here you can give iron in one situation that your stat is below 30% and your ferritin is less than 500 nanogram per milliliter. But if this set is higher, you should not start iron therapy and your ferritin is higher than 500. You would consider that, but your seal is 800. Above 800, it is not advocated to, to give ESA, to give, I'm sorry, iron supplementation. But the Kiduki guidelines have a comment on that. They have stated that, although concern about possible long-term risks has not been eliminated by adequately powered studies, there are currently no data available that suggest long-term IV iron deposition in moderate doses causes worse outcomes, which means that we have a lot of fears of long-standing iron therapy and reaching set and ferritin stores higher level because of a lot of complications such as increased infection and mortality. But you, there is no contraindication to continue IV iron Provided that, provided that the urate set is lower than 30% and your ferritin is below 500 nanogram per meter, and you can continue to give until you reach these levels. When you reach here, you can stop more IV IR. As we can see, as we can see in this diagram, they have found that if you have give excessive iron 
for longer durations, here you will be very vulnerable to, to increase the mortality. So that, please, when you are giving iron, especially IV iron, please follow up your set and follow up your ferritin level to avoid hazards of higher levels. And this is study have showed that and stated that that with higher IV iron and higher levels of the iron in your body, you will have increased cardiovascular mortality. You have increased, of course, non cardiovascular mortality and the infection, as we can see in this situation. But when you are within the accepted range, here you are totally safe. Iron therapy evolution, as we can see in this diagram, iron therapy have started passing through ferrous salts and iron dextran and gluconate, iron sacrose, ferroxyl, ferric carboxymol altose, and ferric citrate at the last. And now the most recent is ferric pyrophosphate citrate. These are different types of oral iron and IV iron and iron indalizate that can be used and approved and have taken the approval to be used during, of course, management of anemia, but within the limits that we have mentioned. There are some oral iron preparations, which iron contents in each, of course, tablet. These are your contents, usually, which may range from one-fifth up to one-sixth of the total dose. Different types of iron have been approved that they can be given orally. While for the parental iron, also, Several types have taken the FDA approval all over the years, starting from the iron dextran and ending with ferric carboxymal tools and other forms can also be used. For the renal association clinical practice guidelines, they have advocated that you have adequate iron status is when you have your serum ferritin from 200 to 500 microgram per liter in hemodialysis patients. And the range is from 100 to 500 micrograms per liter in non-hemodialysis patients. And either the hypochromic red cells less than six or reticulocytic count, hemoglobin content more than 29 picogram, or your head is above 20. If you have this criteria, this will ensure you that, of course, you have adequate iron source. So that, please, while you are managing your patient, put your eyes upon the set, which means iron saturation, and, of course, on your ferritin level, and you can follow also by the hypochromic red cells or reticulocyte hemoglobin content. If you are Within these accepted levels, your patient is safe. Above this accepted level, your patient, of course, will not be accepted. Here, in the guidelines, they have mentioned that treatment of anemia with iron therapy, upper limit for iron therapy. Your upper limit is 800 microgram. And you can review your concern if you have exceeded 500 for the ferritin, but still the situation below 20, you can give more iron with your highest level is 800 microgram, of course, per liter. For the iron therapy also, we suggest avoiding parental iron therapy in patients with active infection. And in this situation, the IV iron, of course, will make suppression for the macrophages, monocytes, and of course, will clear the infection. What about here, the comment of the Kudugi on the Kidugi. In this situation, Kidugi have decided that it is not advised to give uh, tagged RBC transfusion or blood transfusion. And this must be related to if you have acute drop of the hemoglobin or severely symptomatic or with symptoms caused by anemia. And they have stated that when you are allowed to give blood transfusion, the threshold for transfusion in chronic anemia in the absence of symptoms is just below 7 grams per deciliter. If this threshold is arguably much lower than traditional entertained by nephrologist in the US. What about 
the European Renal Association position statement about that, they have recommended that a restrictive blood transfusion strategy is recommended in CKD population. In the individual hemodynamic state patient, a blood transfusion should be considered in the presence of strong indications. If your hemoglobin level below seven, or if your hemoglobin level below eight in post-operative surgical patients and in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, or if you have clear symptoms related to anemia or ESA resistance or considered risk using ESA therapy, of course, as we have mentioned previously, the complications or we mentioned later the complications which may occur with this. So that you should be restricted because nowadays, sometimes we are, there's abuse of red cell transfusion, abuse without any real indication. This is very serious because it may transmit infections and diseases. Also, if your patient is planning for kidney transplantation in this situation, this will produce allocytization, which may be a barrier between you and, of course, transplantation. We have mentioned that. What are the currently available ESA? There is the recombinant human erythropoietin, epoietin alpha, epoietin beta, epoietin theta. We have the longer acting ESA, such as darbipoietin alpha and the cell. This will be discussed later when we are going to speak about, and of course, the biosimilars, such as epoietin zeta. All ESA act on the same target receptors, as we can see. All of them will act on the erythropoietin receptor or the APO receptors for signal transduction, gene activation, and senses of the erythro, of course, point. And differentiation of, I'm sorry, for the differentiation of the RBCs to be differentiated and, of course, proliferation and maturation. As we can see, in addition to the erythropoietin stabilizing agents, either short acting or long acting, either the hypoxic inducible factor, the, we have also other agents such as mimetics, of course, hypoxic inducible factors, GATA or nuclear factor B kappa beta inhibitors, or epigen therapy or eporeceptor interaction. As you can see here, in this situation, you can give activine traps which will inhibit the GATA2 and nuclear factor kappa beta, which inhibits the apogene so that you can allow for proper erythropoiesis. Or you can give the HIV stabilizers, and these stabilizers usually allow and stimulate the sense of erythropoietin, endogenous erythropoietin. Other targeting aporeceptors, the apomimetic peptides, the apofusion proteins, the apogene therapy, the antibody agonist to the APO receptors for its stimulation and the chemical inducers of dimersage. As, as we have mentioned, a very two, of course, hopeful uh, agents now under investigation and in the studies, in clinical trials now, is the hypoxic, of course, induced factor, which will stimulate the APO for endogenous release, and also we may have other factors such as factors that are responsible for inhibition of the GATA, and these factors which produce GATA inhibition and others, and nuclear factor kappa beta, which suppress in this situation the erythropoietin production so that it will be released from the suppression towards EPO release. What are epomimetic peptides? Epomimetic peptides Usually, they are small peptides, potent mimetics of the protein hormone erythropoietin. They are small peptides which can bind the receptor itself and can stimulate it. Here came one of these factors, which of uh, these mimetics is what's known as piginicetide, piginicetide and the commercial name Ominentis and hematide, these can stimulate here the receptor itself by acting at the receptor itself and stimulate it, of course, for the production and, of course, for
for its stimulation for the proliferation of the RBCs and of course for its maturation and synthesis of RBCs. So this is very, very interesting. The pickiness that I, in patients with anemia, undergoing hemodialysis have been tried and they were really very effective and they have achieved the target hemoglobin level. And this is another trial which was compared with the, the ESA. The pigenocytide was very effective and comparable to the ESA, such as epoitin, and was effective and safe, and was effective, I'm sorry, towards, of course, reaching my target hemoglobin level. But with time, after we were very, uh, of course, excited by this pigenocytide, the star is falling down. Why? Because we should know that of its serious side effects, it has serious hypersensitivity actions, including life-threatening and fatal events reported patients receiving, of course, the picking start. And this shows the increased incidence, of course, of anaphylaxis in the and the hypotension in the population who are receiving the picking start. So what else? So the picking start was not convincing. And this mimetics, the epimimetics was not, of course, convincing. And so what's next? As we know that, when we have high altitude, do we have a change due to increasing red cells in the, the circulation due to increased blood viscosity? This was postulated by Volpert 18870. But don't mean that Professor Frankos Gelbert have discovered that when you have low oxygen partial pressure, it will induce increased electrophoresis. This was the base which was built on. As we can see here, in this situation, if you have, of course, have stimulated or have inhibited the stimulated the hypoxic induced gene at this situation, by inhibition of its inhibitor material, as we will be discussed later. This will stimulate the apogene for the apo production and it will act on the apo receptors. Here, it's very important to tell you that this situation you are have more endogenous uh, epoitin production, not exogenous epoitin production, which is produced by the body itself. Here, this is the fact that when you are using hypoxic inducible factor, here, you are increasing the production of the endogenous EPO. This is, and we'll discuss it that later. What are hypoxic inducible factors? Hypoxic inducible factors are transcription factors that respond to changes in available oxygen in the cell environment. They have been defined as oxygen sensors. They are regulated by a family, of course, by prior hydroxylase. Let us see, and these are part of these factors that such as we can mention now, present, of course, under, undergoing the clinical trials, they are phase two and three. They are the Roxad to stat, the Vada to stat, the Dabro to stat, and Mol to stat. These are hypoxia inducing, inducible factor, which may help in senses of production of endogenous point. This is the issue. In this situation, usually the hypoxia inducible factor, usually under the effect of prior hydroxylase, you'll be degraded. You'll be degraded. But when you have severe hypoxia, and this hypoxic induced factor, if you have inhibited, it's degrading enzymes, which is prior hydroxylase. In this situation, it will, it will induce the hypoxic inducible factor. It will, it will be trans, translocated inside the nucleus. It will stimulate the endogenous production of a normal erythropoietin. It has several, of course, benefits. It will increase production of erythropoietin. It will increase upgrade of the aporeceptor. It will suppress the hepcidine. And 
It will increase the transferrin and seroplasmin and other factors responsible for the transportation of iron and utilization of iron. So that in this situation, if you have suppressed the prior hydrolysis enzyme, which is responsible for the degradation of the hypoxia inducible factor, in this situation, it will increase, it will stimulate for the apogene for transcription and for the production of endogenous erythropoietin. So that, what are these factors? We have, as we have mentioned, these are known as oxygen sensors. They are degraded by prolyl hydroxylase enzymes. So that, in the, if you have, if you have given hypoxia inducible factor, prolyl hydroxylase inhibitor. If you give the inhibitor for this hypoxia inducible factor, of course you make stabilization for the hypoxia inducible factor, which will stimulate the apogene for the production of erythropoietin. And here is the situation. If you are giving hypoxia inducible factor, of course, prolyl hydroxyl inhibitor or hypoxia inducible factor, stabilization factors, in this situation, here you will find that your endogenous non-stimulated organ with certain level of erythropoietin, here it will stimulate erythropoietin production, of course. And if you have make that, you not stimulate only erythropoietin production from the kidney, it will be stimulated from any renin producing cell, it will you stimulate the interstitial fibroblast-like cells, you will stimulate the pericytes, you will stimulate the vascular cells, smooth muscle cells, you will stimulate the mesangial cells. So that, through this hypoxia factor stabilization, you will, you will here stimulate all the endogenous, of course, all the endogenous uh, erythropoietin production from several organs so that you will have a higher level and you can approach and achieve your target hormone. So that this group have been determined as hypoxia inducible factor stabilizer or called prolyl hydroxylase inhibitor, which they are reversibly inhibit the prolyl, prolyl hydroxylase catalytic activity by binding to the ferrous iron containing active site, thereby blocking entry of the co substrate fusion. Here is the mechanism of action of this hypoxia inducible factors. Normally, as we have mentioned previously, you have hypoxia inducible factor. The propyl hydroxylase, this group, will act on these hypoxia inducible factors and produce propyl hydroxylation, leading to its degradation so that it will prevent the expression of its gene. But in cases of hypoxia, or in case of hypoxia in this factor stabilizers or propyl hydroxylase inhibition, if you have inhibited this propyl hydroxylase, so that you allow increase the level of hypoxia inducing factor without being degraded, and if you have increases, it will help that expression of the hypoxia inducible factor target genes have several actions. They will reduce hepcidine, which prevents iron absorption, so that it will increase iron availability. It will stimulate erythropoietin senses, which will, of course, at the end lead to erythropoiesis. These are several trials that have discussed this hypoxia inducible factor stabilizers, such as in this study, and they have shown that the hemoglobin have reached the, a good target level. Another paper for the Roxabstat, when it was compared with the apoitin alpha, here it shows a comparable effect. Another study also showed when you are given these hypoxia factors, of course, you have excellent response and you can reach your target. In this other study also, that have in which roxabstat hypoxia inducible stabilizer have been used we have reached marvelously our target hemoglobin level uh, this is another study when it was compared with a poitin level in this situation 
we have found that, of course, we have reached our target. A lot of studies have been advocated to discuss the response and to, to study and to assess the response and the results who are very supportive. This is another study also in non-dialysis patients and hemodialysis patients, and we have achieved our target hemoglobin level. This is study on another drug, which is Taban, of course, several variants from hypoxia inducible factors here. The Daprostat, we have shown that it has achieved a marvelous level in this situation. Another drug have appeared, which is the valid state from the same group with excellent response and reaching our level, of course. And a fourth drug, which is molybdenum, have appeared, and of course this is one of the hypoxia inducible factor stabilizers, and of course we have reached excellent results and hemoglobin stabilization in this situation. And Another study have shown that it was of excellent results and we have reached, of course, here our targets for management in these patients. And another factors have appeared, several, several factors. And here are a very recent studies, September 2019. Here have, of course, have stated that roxadostat for anemia in patients with kidney disease not receiving dialysis and it was very effective another study roxadostat treatment for anemia in patients undergoing long-term dialysis and also was very effective here another target that showed that it is very effective when compared with the epoiton alpha several several studies have appeared and all these studies showed the efficacy of the hypoxia inducible factor stabilizer roxadostat so that here come the very 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 hopeful future for the hypoxia inducible factor for the treatment of anemia in chronic kidney disease and studies and papers and review articles are very enthusiastic with this drug of course until now these are the drugs which are being or, or for trial, Roxadostat, Vedadostat, the Prostadostat, Moldostat, and finally Inardostat. And in China, Fibrogen company have taken the, if the China FDA approval for Roxadostat as a new drug application for treatment of anemia with dialysis and non dialysis and have taken from 2017 the, the China FDA approval use. Published clinical trials for this mentioned drug are going on numerously now, and they have found that they are, were very effective regarding, of course, and they are oral, being given orally, they are given orally and they, they are proven to be very effective in management of anemia in CKD patients. But nothing is perfect. Let us discuss what are, of course, what are ESA pros and cons. We know that the ESA, as we know that, are effective, long clinical experience, good safety profile, no pill burden, it is subcutaneous or IV. And what's against that, usually you have, are giving a very high levels of EPO levels and your body have a high levels, still expensive, increased vascular risk at high doses or excessive volume correction, increased oncologic risk. So that, these are, of course, this is query, this is not yet proven. So that for ESA use, these are the pro and these are the cons. Let us compare that with the hypoxia inducible factor. What are pro use? Stimulation of endogenous EPO, natural endogenous EPO. It is effective. It is increased iron utilization, not influenced by inflammation. They are claiming that it could be cheaper 
than ESA. What are the cons? Of course, we have no long-term data. You can't approve a drug strongly until you have a long-term data. Corpil burden, it is given orally. Unexpected effects may sometimes we have found that it may have uh, been hepatotoxic and several side effects. And it will stimulate the vascular serial growth factor, which may increase fibrosis so that it may worsen the kidney situation and, of course, the diabetic retinopathy. So that, is it a friend or foe? Friend, as it increased production of EPO, decreased level of hepcidine and improved chronic inventory status, potential benefits on improving total cholesterol profile and blood pressure, lowering effect on CKD patients, it decreases cholesterol and blood pressure, decreased cardiovascular risk in CKD patient, which is still to be proved. It's a friend because it's given orally with possible avoidance of supraphysiological EPO and iron concentration, improve iron utilization through suppression of the hepcidine. It's responsible for blood pressure reduction, helps in lip lipid lowering effect, reduce the progression of kidney disease, decrease inflammation only, but if you have the original disease is fibrotic, it may be worse, and it protects against ischemia. But what are foe? In appropriate activation of hypoxic factor is associated with exacerbation of fibrogenesis, which is very important, which duration of kidney function, deleterious cardiac effects regarding cardiomyopathy, induction fibrosis in several organs may have affection on the brain, and of course, they have unexpected effects such as hepatotoxicity. Still, it's very, very premature to have your judgment because you have no long-term studies and of course here, the bill burden in this situation is still, of course, a problem. Possible side effects, as we have seen also, increasing pulmonary artery pressure, enhanced growth of renal cysts, tumor progression, so that we don't know what are the long-term efficacy, destabilization of atherosclerotic plaques, other factors such as activine physiology and activine trap. These activines usually, when we are used, they, well, of course, they are belong to transforming growth factor beta. They are usually responsible for spatogenesis, insulin secretion, bone growth, osteoclasts, and osteoplast, stimulation osteoclasts and inhibition of osteoclasts. Usually, you have two now under investigation, which is sotatercept and lospatercept. They are very effective in enhanced bone formation, reduce primary arterial pressure, improve anemia in patients with myelodysplastic disorders. The mechanism of action, they will bind, they will bind the act are to a ligands, and by this, these ligands are responsible for suppression of the epigen, so that you will remove the suppression part for the epigen, so that this will help for activation of the epigen. The, the, the uh, GATA inhibitors in this situation have the same rule. We, you have two factors here, and they will inhibit the GATA, which is responsible for suppression, of course, of the APO gene. Here, as we can see, sutatercept, which is a fusion protein, it will, of course, fuse with the extracellular component of the activine receptor, which is a suppressor for the APO gene so that it may help in correction of anemia, but still it is in trial. So that studies have started for this transforming growth factor beta superfamily ligand, which has which known as uh, trapping activator. So that studies are going for this receptor fusion protein to detect its efficacy on removal of the inhibition on the apogene and its stimulation. As you can see, the presence of this factor, as we can see, helps in proliferation of the erythrocytes and, of course, maturation of the erythroplasts and, of course, increase hemoglobin level. Trials have been done, are going now on two markers of them, but still, still, of course, they, when they were used, they were used for metastatic breast cancer, for the one, for the, for the other one, with solid tumors, of course, uh, used for treatment, so that these are originally anti-tumor factors, but they were found that they will release 
the suppression of the apogene so that when it's of course stimulated, this will stimulate the proliferation and maturation of erythroblasts. Several, several studies for that. What about hepcidine? Hepcidine is the master regulation of systemic iron homeostasis. Of course, it's responsible for the absorption of iron. So when it is increased, it will suppress the absorption of iron, such as inflammatory situation. So that have appeared the anti hepcidine agents, such as lexa, 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 lexa This is responsible for suppression of hepcidine and increased iron availability and increased iron mobilization from its stores to be utilized by the memory for the senses of RBCs. And started here in anemia that factors have been, of course, introduced for inhibition of hepcidine in this situation. And these are several trials in recent studies 2019 for that. And they are claiming if you have relieved them, uh, if, if you have suppressed the hepcidine, you'll increase the level of anemia. So that here is a question. Are we approaching the end of the recombinant EPO era? We don't know the answer yet, but it is very, very premature. And this is a very important article. Will it, there still be a role for the originator erythropoiesis stimulating agents after the biosimilars and the hypoxia inducible factor stabilizers approval? Still very premature, and we'll see the fight between all these players now. But let us go to a very important issue to our traditional, to our friend, when we are using it, uh, them, which are the erythropoietin. We know that erythropoietin, there is nobody on dialysis haven't used erythropoietin. Most of dialysis patients have used erythropoietin. I, I, not all, but not most, but all of them. We are very familiar with dialysis patients. All dialysis patients know them very well. We have, of course, third generation, such as epoitin alpha and epoitin alpha, and these are used in the US. But what we have epoitin alpha, which is the apex by Jensen, and it is worldwide is being used. We have epoitin beta, the recormone, of course, Roche in Europe, and we have second generation uh, ESA, which is darbopoitin, the RNSP by Amgen, and third generation ESA, which is, of course, the Mercera by Roche in Europe. So that these are the familiar erythropoietin agents that, that we are used uh, in managing of our uh, patients. In this situation, of course, Eprex, of course, is usually one of the very important to be used in management of anemia in CKD and dialysis patients. But when to start this Eprex? Address all correctable causes of anemia prior to initiation of ESA therapy. If non-dialysis patients, hemoglobin above 10, ESA not to be initiated. In, in below 10, initiation should be individualized and it's advisable to start. But if you have reached stage five dialysis, it therapy should be initiated just when hemoglobin is below 10 to avoid the occurrence of, of course, severe anemia and the need for packed RBC transfusion. All patients must have adequate iron stores, which means before you start it, you retain more than 200 and it's set above 20% so that your apex to find adequate iron stores and they can achieve this target. Blood pressure should be well controlled because one of the side effects is hypertension. What are the dose of my epoitin alpha? It is to start 50 to 100 international unit per kilogram three times a week. This is usually your recommended dose. What's your target hemoglobin level? Target hemoglobin level is to increase one gram per deciliter per month. But if your hemoglobin have been increased by more than two grams over one month, it should be stopped. Target hemoglobin not to be exceed 11.5 grams per deciliter. What are those mod modifications for the apex? If hemoglobin level increases, apex and I need, and other, of course, is reported in factor. If hemoglobin level increases by more than one gram within two weeks, then Reduce the dose of EPO or EPREX by 25%. If hemoglobin level not increases by more than 100 gram percent per month, then increase dose of EPO by 25%. Adverse events of ESA therapy, of course, we have potential benefits. Decreased need for blood transfusion, improvement of quality of life, but be careful if you have exceeded the level, your hemoglobin, if you have exceeded 13, you will increase, of course, 
the cardiovascular events, stroke and thrombosis and hypertension. But don't need that. Sometimes if you have pure cell aplasia, which is in this situation, this antibodies against the dysphoretin, please stop it because here you will increase the level of the anemia and you need for packed RBCs transfusion. But sometimes when you are using, you have ease. When to define that you have resistance to ether therapy, we recommend that in a deep response, resistance to ether therapy is defined as failure to reach the target hormone level despite subtenuous epoitin dose. If you have used Eprex or others more than 300 units per kilogram per week or 450 units per kilogram per week IV or others, here, of course, you have uh, ESA resistant. What are the responsible causes for this hyper-responsiveness? You have major causes, iron deficiency, so that you should replenish your iron stores. Of course, infection, inflammation under dialysis. For infection, you should treat the infection. Inflammation, please use the biocompatible membranes and the uncompatible membranes may, of course, will stimulate complete formation. Minor, poor compliance, poor adherence with the therapy. Blood loss, of course, hyperparathyroidism, immune toxicity, vitamin D or fluid deficiency, hemolysis, primary bone marrow disorders, other disorders such as myelitis plastic syndrome, so that you should be careful of that. Hemoglobinopathy, sickle cell disease, ACE inhibitors, which is, or, and ARBs, you should stop this drug. Carnitine deficiency, anti apo antibodies causing, of course, pure cell aplasia, you should stop. So that when you have high poor responsiveness to either, please, don't stop ESA. You should search for the underlying cause for this resistance or hyper-responsiveness. And usually when you are treating the underlying cause, such as retention of dialysis stores, treatment of infection, using dialysis pipeline, adequate dialysis, proper KT over V, correction of hyperthyroidism, avoidance of blood loss, avoidance of toxicity by avoidance of aluminum-containing agents, correction of vitamin B12, correction of free deficiency, and avoidance of hemolysis, and if you have hematological diseases by consultation of other specialists, such as myelitis plastic drums and sickle cell, stoppage of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and of course, the rare situation of uh, pure cell aplasia. In this situation, usually after correction of the cause of resistance, you may find a good response. This table, I'm not discussing, this is how you can convert between different types, of course, of short-acting and intermediate and long-acting, of course, ESA use. For the APREX, for, of course, the more, the more recent renal attrition guidelines, trigonemia, choice of ESA. We recommend that the decision on choice of ESA is based on local availability of ESA. Adjuvant therapy, they have found that androgens of no use, and other vitamins such as C, D, E, folic acid, ergotene, and pentoxifeline, of course, of no value. What are contraindications of ESA? If you have previous history of thrombotic vascular event in past six months, previous history of seizure, uncontrolled hypertension, risk factors predisposed to or pre-operative DVT, hypercoagulable diseases, cancer, of course, diagnosis or treatment in past years, but this is not an absolute contraindication. In all these situations, you can use such as prothrombotic events, but, but at a lower dose and cautiously. Here, with incisors, you can use it after co proper control by anti-epileptic drugs, uncontrolled hypertension by proper dialysis and adding anti epileptic medications. So in most of these situations, these are not contraindications, but are relative. And usually, after correction of the underlying cause and giving the ESA carefully, giving the apex carefully may be very uh, beneficial. I will skip that. Of course, you should choose your dialyzer. Here, hemodiafiltration helps the response for ESA rather than the, the non-compatible membranes. As you can see, if you, if you have used in this situation, the, uh, of course, high volume online High diafiltration, hemodiafiltration, more clearance of uremic toxins, decreased plasma hepcidine, decreased inflammation, decreased oxygen stress, and so you will help in improving ESA resistance and improve survival. So that you should search for the underlying cause of hyperresponsiveness. The use of the ultra pure dialysate will help reduction of inflammation and will help increase the responsible the response to ESA. And here your target hemoglobin, 
according to renal association clinical practice 2017 from 10 to 12 grams per deciliter in young people and the children aged two years and older and 95 uh, i'm sorry 9.5 to 11.5 gram per deciliter in children younger than uh, two years so that in adults we are speaking about from 10 to 12 and more precis uh, precisely we can make it from 10.5 to 11.5 of course this is very important in, in this situation and um, treatment of anemia without ESA therapy we said that hemoglobin target range applies to patients receiving ESA and are not intended to apply to the treatment of iron deficiency in patients receiving iron therapy without the use of ESA. So that, please correct your anemia and your iron, your iron deficiency and give ESA. First line treatment, sometimes forgotten. Please, in cases of resistance and anemia, save your blood of patients. Don't make blood clots and bleeding on dialysis. Ensure there is adequacy so that you will remove your toxins and you'll give better chance for ESA. Correct inflammation by using the biocompatible membrane and the hemodial filtration, uh, high flux membranes. This will remove better uric toxins, avoid here activation of complement and correct anemia. Of course, prevent malnutrition for your patient to need proper protein intake so that you can synthesize hemoglobin, the globin part of your hemoglobin so that you will have, you can prevent the presence of anemia. Here we have found that with, of course, better dialysis adequacy, with better KT over V, you will need, you will have a better response and lower dose of ESA. Here is the same. As you can see here, several factors contribute to variety and ESA resistance. So that before you are getting, you are Telling us that there is no response to ESA or hyper response, you should correct these factors. Patient factors, chronic inflammation, please correct it. Second hypertension, please correct it. Iron storage, replenish it. Nutrition states, ensure proper nutrition. Hematological disorders, consult hematologist in sickle cell and myelitis plastic disorders and red blood cell lifespan by using, of course, uh, of course, the proper membranes and vitamin E, of course, coated membranes. Intercurrent event, such an infection, treated, acute inflammation, treated. Hospitalization, of course, avoid that. Bleeding hemolysis, in this situation, you should, of course, stop the source of bleeding, if uh, upper GIT or lower GIT. Pure cell aplesia, please, of course, in this situation, stop the ESA. Medications, don't give such as ACE inhibitors, ARBs, they may inhibit the formation of that. Enter the with gain, avoid, of course, that, because this will add more ultra filtration will help, of course, in your situation for anemia. Practice patterns, that is modality by hemodial filtration. Hemoglobin sample, of course, reduce it. Hemoglobin assay variability, proper assay. Dialysis adequacy, improve your dialysis adequacy with proper KT over V, more than 1.2. Anemia management in the proper way. ESA, of course, to give, be given properly and include those if there is no response. Proper iron supplementation of course, and you should apply your local policy according to your situation for your patients. But there still be a rule for the hydrogen stimulating agent after the biosimilar and the hypoxic factorization approval. Let us see. For the ASA, it proves effective long clinical experience, acceptable safety profile, noble burden, but cons. High erythropoietin level, hypertension risk, endothelium stimulation, Small cardiac risk at higher dose and or excessive hemoglobin target. Small oncologic risk, small thrombotic risk, still expensive, but you can use it very usually. But for the hypoxia inducible agent, also, it is not totally safe. Prones, effective, stimulation of endogenous EPO, no hypertension, higher suppression of epstein, not influenced by inflammation, better iron absorption, chemical drug, of course, it will reduce LDL, effective in other conditions but cones, no long-term data, which is very serious, potential vascular genetic factor with fibrogenesis and duration of the kidney functions. It may, of course, produce the high-density like protein cholesterol reduction, which is protective, pill burden, of course, oral intake, possible activation of several genes because it may induce malignancy, selectivity oncogenic risk, damage due to chronic hypoxia, of course, 
exhaustion of apple stimulation, your induction there will be, of course, exhausted, and this may be deleterious, and it may produce pulmonary hypertension. So that, in this situation, hemodial filtration and DISA, I would love. We'll speak here about what are new treatment approach in renal anemia. Of course, our coronary stone are iron supplementation and ESA therapy, but you may target the aporeceptor, apomimetic peptides. Of course, this may help you, such as pregnisside, but in this situation, we have a severe side effects such as anaphylaxis and hypotension. Apofusion proteins, such as apo-apo dimers, they have been used, but still they have hypersensitivity effect, despite they being effective, and we are in need still for more evaluation. Antibody agonist to APO receptor. This antibody will stimulate the APO receptor for, of course, erythropoiesis, but it's still very expensive. It's still in phase two and three clinical trials and still doesn't give the, the approval. APO gene therapy. This is, of course, an excellent choice, but it's still investigational. And until now, we have no proper APO gene therapy uh, uh, protocol available that may help our patient and also to be very, very expensive. Dimerization of aporeceptor intercellular domain with a CID this is very important in this situation. Through chemical inducer of dimerization, you may help stimulation of the aporeceptor, but still all these are in phase one and phase two trials and it's premature to be judged, not directly targeting the aporeceptor, HIF stabilizers, not directly, but it helps, of course, endogenous erythropoietin, such as HIF stabilizers, such as Roxerostat and others, activine traps that may help removal of the inhibitors of the apogene, such as sotatricept and losbatricept and others. At the end of my talk, I want to tell you that our coronary stone now in the management is still the apex, which is the, the ESA, the erythropoietin stimulant factor. We are friendly with them. We are very familiar with them. All these drugs, we still under investigation and still under evaluation are expensive drugs. We don't know the safety of these drugs. We didn't apply it in the clinical practice. We don't know the long-term sequence of these drugs so that these drugs will need a very, very long time to prove themselves and to be in the market if they deserve that. But still, until this moment, Aprex and our ESA are the cornerstone of management. But when you use it, please, Please, in this situation, start at the proper time, start at the proper dose, avoid uh, if a complication occurred, of course, uh, manage this complication. And if you have resistance, please search for the cause of resistance. Don't tell that these are not effective drugs. Try as good as possible to treat the underlying cause of resistance. And if you have treated, most probably, these drugs will work effectively in my life. Most of the patients will respond if you have treated the underlying uh, cause. And you should change the proper modality for dialysis, high flux membrane with, with uh, private compatible membrane. And you should, of course, increase adequacy of dialysis, improve nutrition of patients, correction of folic acid if deficient, correction of vitamin 12 if deficient, and, at the, and of course, management of hyperparathyroidism, avoid uh, management of aluminum toxicity. You should correct all these factors and give these in proper doses. And of course, you will have, you will achieve your proper target of hemoglobin safely and you reach with the apex and this is a group to your target hemoglobin safely. And thank you. We have finished, of course, our late literature. Yes, yes. Uh, we have finished now our lecture, and I have several questions for that. The first question is starting dose and the maximum dose for erythropoietin, alpha and beta. The starting dose is usually 500 microgram per kg. Per, per, per kg per week. This is your starting dose. And every two weeks, you'll upgrade your dose 75 up to reaching 100 milligram. And here you monitor your effect by the hemoglobin level. 
you should raise the hemoglobin per one gram per month. If your hemoglobin has been raised more than two grams per month, you should, of course, stop your uh, retropoietin intake. This is very, very important. If you have achieved your target and you have reached 12, at this situation, you will reduce the dose by 25% and one month later, you will follow up the level of the hemoglobin. Again, this is very, very important. And if you, if you, have, you are given a certain maintenance therapy of ESA and you have a hemoglobin drop by 25, uh, you have, if, you have, if you have hemoglobin drop below 10, at this situation, you will increase the dose by 25%. This is uh, the answer of the first question. The second question, a female patient in this stage kidney disease on regular hemodialysis with hemoglobin 13, T set 11, patients like that are candidates for IV iron. Yes, if you have a female patient with regular hemodialysis and hemoglobin 13, and your set is 11, here you are not giving, uh, you, are, you will give the maintenance dose of iron even if you have iron deficiency, but you should avoid to give a very high dose of iron for full correction, because here the hemoglobin may reach 14 and 15, and here it's very liable to have a thrombotic events. So that, at this situation, give iron maintenance dose, which is 100 milligram every two weeks or every six dialysis session with following up with the hemoglobin. If your hemoglobin is dropping, you may increase the dose. And if your hemoglobin is stabilized, you will continue on this maintenance therapy. But if your hemoglobin is increasing, please stop or reduce the frequency of iron intake. Starting dose, 50 unit per kilogram per week or dose. No, the starting dose would be 50 unit per kilogram per week and not per dose. Another question, which is anemia in CKD is a contraindication for ACE inhibitors and ARBs? No, of course, this is not right. The reverse is the right. If you have anemia in CKD, ACE and ARBs are protective for the kidney. You should manage this anemia. Number one, you should measure your iron, TIBC, ferritin, your hypochromia, your reticulocytes, your uh, T-set, and in this situation, in this situation, of course, after correction, in this situation, give the proper iron. You can try oral iron if you are CKD for three months, or you can give parental iron, but usually in non-dialysis patients, we prefer oral iron to avoid injections. And of course, this may not be suitable for the patient. But in dialysis, IV may be a better rule, especially that capsidine will suppress the absorption of oral iron. So number one, correct your iron. After correction, your iron, give the proper dose of ESA and increase it. Correct other factors, correct inflammation, correct infections, correct secondary or, ter or tertiary or primary hyperparathyroidism, avoid aluminum toxicity, of course, correct of folic acid deficiency, correction of B, 12 deficiency, make all your best for the correction. Usually, you'll achieve. In a very minor situation, if you have done your best and still your anemia is not corrected, you will be, you will, try, you will of course, this situation, of course, you'll go for trial of uh, discontinue the, the ACE or ARBs, the ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and to see and to follow up the response. But if your patient is doing very well, and his hemoglobin is stabilized by iron, ESA, and proper therapy, and you have given ACE or ARBs and rapid hemoglobin of, uh, hemoglobin of uh, rapid drop of the hemoglobin occurred, in this situation, of course, search for the underlying cause. If you have found a correctable underlying cause from the mention we have mentioned previously, from all this data, please, in this situation, not to stop ACE or ARBs, but to treat that line cause from iron replenishment, those of ESA, others and others that we have mentioned. But if you have made your best in this situation and hemoglobin is not responding and anemia is persistent here, you should stop ACNAPs or ARBs and 
to be replaced by other antihypertensive uh, medication. This is for the question. And they are asking me about treatment of pure red cell aplasia. For treatment of pure red cell aplasia, please, number one, you should, in this situation, have a proper diagnosis of pure red cell aplasia. Not everyone taking ESA or erythropoietin and they have anemia it is known as pure red cell aplasia. As we have mentioned, we have several, several causes for dropping of hemoglobin, search for GIT bleeding, search for occult blood in stool, search for malignancy, search for iron deficiency, folate deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, infections, hyperparathyroidism, aluminum toxicity, end of on dialysis, adequacy of dialysis, the biocompatible membrane, and all, all we have mentioned in our lecture of factors responsible for anemia. If still you have anemia and rapid hemoglobin drop, what means by that you, your hemoglobin is dropping more than one gram per week, and you have in this situation, of course, severe reticular cytopenia. In this situation, you should measure here in this situation the erythropoietin antibodies. You have to search and make your test for detection of erythropoietin antibodies. But you, it is not routinely to be asthma or patient, but in a, special, in, in a specific situation. If you haven't erythropoietin antibodies, this means that you have no pure red cell aplasia. This anemia is due to something else. But if you have pure red cell aplasia in this situation, you have a stop, of course, the erythropoietin. How to manage the situation? You should stop the erythropoietin, and sometimes it is advised to try another one because you have erythropoietin alpha, erythropoietin beta, and erythropoietin zeta, erythropoietin theta, and you have for short acting, you have intermediate acting just as darpopoietin, and you have, of course, the long acting such as the mercer. In this situation, you can change your erythropoietin by another molecule, because these molecules have different configuration. If still with other molecules, here you have the same pure red cell aplasia, so that you are now cornered. You can't use all of these groups, but before you can judge that, please, please, in your situation, please measure the antibodies and check that this is the cause. And if this is the real cause, in the situation, you will depend upon iron therapy. You, and in cases that uh, hemoglobin drop markedly below 7 or are symptomatizing or preoperative hemoglobin below than 8 with cardiovascular risks and others, in this situation, you should go very solidly because I don't like red cell transfusion. I don't like transfusion because of the risk of the transfusions, of the risk of infection, I usually make this my last resort. After total failure for everything, I will go, and I'm not happy for that, for packed RBC transfusion. And here will come the future. The future in this situation, now you will try EPO isomers. You will try epoitin mimetics or epomimetics. You will try apofusion peptides. You will try hypoxia-inducible factor stabilizers. You will try, of course, trap activine and other groups. You will try modulators and inhibitors of uh, hepcidine. You will try apogene if this becomes available. You will try, of course, the monoclonal antibodies against the aporeceptor for its, for its stimulation. But now, being in the market appeared with China FDA approval, with China, such as drugs which have mentioned by hypoxia-induced factor stabilizers, I think you may try these drugs, and in this situation, you are called to use it, and this may, may give you the hope for the management of pure red cell aplasia. I will... I will uh, there is another question, is ACE or ARBs? is contraindicated in CKD patient, and what its effect on erythropoietin? This is a very important question. 
Is or arms are not contraindicated in sacred images. Is and arms are really protective. They are they advocated to be used in sacred patients. Most of people are using him in a friendly way up to stage three. Some people have some concern about it to be used in stage four B and five. Of course, non dialysis it can be used safely during dialysis. It the only drug that had been proven to be uh, regarding the anti medications to be renal protective this is the only drug that from the anti medication that have efficacy on proteinuria it may improve it it may improve microalbuminuria improve macro to microalbuminuria and of course it is it is a, a separate lecture that can prove that the ASO and ARBs are very important drugs as renal protective drug. Only you will stop these drugs if you developed acute kidney injury, or you may stop it if you have intractable hyperkalemia. But if you have no acute kidney injury, if you have intractable hyperkalemia, these drugs are the drug of a choice for hypertension and for stabilization of kidney function and to be renal protective. This is the answer of the first part of your question. What's its effect on erythropoiety? This is a very important question. As you know that, its effect is really, the pathogenesis is not really understood, but they claim that sometimes the erythroplasts, sometimes the erythroplasts may have the ACE, the ACE gene, the ACE receptor, I'm sorry. Sometimes they may have the ACE receptors and the angiotensin one receptors. So that if you're given these drugs, you may, of course, they will bind the receptors on the red blood cells and they may produce its inhibition. So that in this situation, of course, uh, uh, of course, it is not, of course, ad uh, advised to use these drugs for the management of hypertension or CKD if they were associated with the occurrence uh, of uh, anemia. Sometimes that, when you are giving the erythropoietin, they will act as competitive inhibitor for the receptors, on the receptor for the aporeceptors, so that, please, in this situation, it is not advocated to use ACE or ARBs for the management uh, of CKD patients, if, if of course, uh, in, in this situation, of course, if it is you have used ACE or ARBs and anemia have occurred, it is not recommended to use these drugs, but after exhaustion ourselves, as we have mentioned several times in my lecture, for determination of the cause of the anemia and proper correction of the anemia, if there is nothing to be corrected else, you should stop ACE and ARBs and follow up the response. This is for the question for ACE or ARBs, CKD and its effect on erythropoietin. This a very important question, which is, is Roxostat is approved by FDA? Really, it is not approved until now by FDA in Europe and USA, but it is approved only in China. But Robert said it's not approved, it is coming strongly, it is off-label, but I think in its way to get the approval because of its, uh, of course, because of its beneficial effects, as we have mentioned, and mainly, its action mainly is through increase the endogenous erythropoietin, so that you not need the higher dose of erythropoietin, so that you will avoid the complication of the erythropoietin, such as hypercarbocyte, thrombotic events, stroke, MI, increased buzz viscosity, so that this is the main benefit, primary hypertension and others, so this is the main benefit of the Proxostat, which is one of the hypoxia inducible factor uh, stabilizer. So that un until this moment, it is not taking the approval apart men in China only. I hope that uh, I have answered all your questions. Uh, I hope that you have get some benefit from my lecture. If you have any other questions, I am ready to answer.
And Raban, I'm very happy to be with you today. I'm very happy that we have spoken in my lecture about normal erythropoiesis. We have spoken about the guidelines such as the Kiduki, Kiduki urine practice guidelines, renal, uh, of course, practice guidelines, association practical guidelines, and nice guidelines and others. We have spoken about the use of iron, the use of oral iron, IV iron, the use of erythropoietin, uh, the proper use of erythropoietin, how to start, when to start, how you can titrate the dose, how to increase, how to decrease, when to stop. We have spoken about your target levels of hemoglobin, the contraindications and adverse effects of the ESA we have mentioned in this lecture. We have, of course, spoken about the future for other, uh, the guidelines regarding the anemia level, when to start and when to stop, and what's your target of hemoglobin level. And we have spoken about several, several drugs which are now uh, are getting uh, evolving in the market, such as the erythropoietin mimetics, the erythropoietin or the apofusion peptides, and we have spoken about the activine and trap activine drugs, which may inhibit the GATA and other inhibitors of, of the apogene for proliferation of the erythrocytes. We have spoken about hypoxia inducing factor stabilizers, such as roxidostate, valvidostate, and moldustate, and others. We have spoken, of course, about hepcidine and drugs that modulate hepcidine. And we have known about what are pro ESA and cons for ESA and what are the benefits of the hypoxia inducer factor, which may be a future, and uh, what, are the, what are the cons for that. And there is a question which is very important. Are these drugs will replace the ESA in the future? Until now, there is no answer, because these drugs, until now, lack the long-term studies, lack its safety, lack its long-term efficacy, they may produce primary hypertension. Of course, still serious side effects may occur, such as hepatotoxicity, so that until now there is no proven that these drugs may replace ESA. And until now, ESA such as Iprex and other similar drugs are the drugs of the choices. They are very familiar with us. They are friendly with the patient. We have used them millions of times, not thousands. No patient on dialysis haven't used Iprex or ESA. No patient on most patients of CKD, especially stage, stage four and five, are starting uh, ESA. These are the drug of choices. Even there's their high responsiveness. If you have searched for the underlying cause in this situation, you can correct this high responsiveness. So regarding the complications, if you have used them properly and with proper follow-up of the patient, you can avoid, of course, these uh, uh, side effects so that they are relatively is, are considered to be safe drugs and they are such a prex and others in normal practice in our life and they are very friendly for the patient and for us as doctors and we are experienced with them and we are know that we are of course uh, know very well about the long-term sequel and effects that are safe drugs and friend drugs thank you again and hoping See you, inshallah, very soon in another lecture.